You have with you, I hope, A.J. Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic. And would you therefore turn to the first chapter, which uh, begins on page 33. Uh, we should perhaps observe that the introduction was, um, let's see, the introduction to the first edition was in 1935, and the introduction to this edition, the much longer initial introduction that runs up to page 26, was uh, 10 years later, in 46. And in that 10 years, Ayer had been exposed to all sorts of criticism, including the beginnings of the ordinary language tradition that um, we've referred to and we're looking at more in detail. And so um, this edition then, um, while the, uh, the text itself is from 35, comes to us with certain changes introduced in the introduction, which soften somewhat the hard-nosed scientific positivism that comes through in the body of the text. But um, it's the body of the text, the first edition, that historically has been so tremendously influential and which popularized the logical positivist or logical empiricist, as it's sometimes called, um, movement in the middle decades of this century. Uh, chapter one on the elimination of metaphysics sets the stage. And it's plain that that has to come first in as much as uh, pretty well every other topic taken up in subsequent chapters hinges on that elimination of metaphysics. After all, without metaphysics, the function of philosophy is changed. The nature of philosophical analysis is not going to be such that it's telling us about a reality beyond experience. The a priori does not tell us about reality, it's simply tautological. And uh, truth and probability can be taken in a phenomenalist rather than a realist sense. And um, ethics does not tell us about objective moral order in reality, nor does theology tell us about the metaphysical entity uh, known as God. So that the elimination of metaphysics is, if you like, not only the title of the first chapter, but it's the underlying thesis that runs through the entirety of the book. Now, um, you may say to yourself, um, well, curious that he eliminated metaphysics because we have been having a course on contemporary metaphysics. Here we are just a few days, decades later on, and metaphysics seems to be alive and well. What's happened? Well, uh, two things. One, we commented on last time the critique of the verifiability criterion of meaning on the basis of which metaphysics was declared meaningless. And with that criterion disposed of, people can now do metaphysics again in good philosophical conscience. But the second reason is that people began to rethink what do we mean by metaphysics? What is the essential nature of metaphysics? And you can uh, see the point if you look on page 33, uh, the first sentence of the second paragraph, uh, the understanding of metaphysics that he has. 
He says we may begin by criticizing the metaphysical thesis that philosophy affords us knowledge of a reality transcending the world of common sense and science, the world of science and common sense. Now, you've um, been reading Whitehead, who is 20th century metaphysician par excellence. And he is not interested in realities transcending the world of science and common sense. Whitehead is concerned as to whether the entities that science theorizes about and that ordinary experience or common sense encounters, whether these are properly understood. Uh, for Whitehead, metaphysics is not about some transcendent reality, but is about the reality encountered in science and common sense. And he just wants to make sure uh, that um, we have the best science possible and don't engage in mistaken concreteness, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So, um, in effect, Whitehead's view is that metaphysics is a speculative system that grows out of and incorporates proper scientific concepts and concrete experience. It's a speculative system that intends to engage in extrapolation, generalization from what we know to encompass the whole. And so he develops his conceptualization of an event based on both ordinary experience and science and then generalizes that everything that exists is of the nature of an event, so described, God included. So a different conception of metaphysics. And uh, one, I think Whitehead would say, which runs back all the way through modern history and back even into the Greeks. But that's not the only conception of metaphysics which developed. Um, there was, uh, in addition to that, uh, a conception of metaphysics adapted from the medieval way of analogy. The medievals, you remember, with their hierarchy of being, talked of analogical predication. There are degrees of being and of various properties. And uh, there was, in the uh, 1940s, a book published by Dorothy Emmett, quite influential, a book by Dorothy Emmett called The Nature of Metaphysical Thinking, which suggested that metaphysics is an attempt to uh, work with a coordinating analogy, a coordinating analogy drawn from ordinary experience. Um, similarly, there was a book by Stephen Pepper called uh, world Hypotheses, also published in the early 1940s, in which he talked of root metaphors which are developed into metaphysical schemes, conceptual schemes. So that what you have here is the notion of an all-embracing conceptual scheme as metaphysics an all-abracing scheme which is able to unify everything by virtue of some coordinating analogy or some metaphor which runs through the whole field. So that uh, Pepper would say, for instance, and uh, Pepper would say that the conception of an organismic model is a root metaphor. Emmett would say it's a coordinating analogy. A mechanistic metaphysic has the mechanistic root metaphor, coordinating analogy. 
you see. The form and matter uh, duality in Greek metaphysics, drawn, if you like, from a work of art, the form and the matter, provides another root metaphor, coordinating analogy. So what you have then is a conceptual scheme uh, based on some uh, such uh, conceptual aid, spinning off from the notion of analogical thinking that was developed in other ways in the Middle Ages. Um, there is a third conception of metaphysics which grew out of the ordinary language movement that we'll be um, exploring as uh, conceptual map work. And uh, that's represented by Ian Ramsey, who taught at Oxford uh, the notion of conceptual map work. He has a book called Prospect for Metaphysics published also in the 1940s, Prospect for Metaphysics. Con uh, conceptual map work, that, that is to say, uh, charting the ways in which in ordinary language we do talk of the whole of reality in certain, um, um, uh, pays attention to the use of the word I, the use of the word I as um, a unifying point in uh, talking about one's um, experience and uh, suggests that in similar fashion the word God uh, functions as a unifier of discourse, a unifier of conceptualization in any theistic scheme. So um, the emphasis, uh, I think it's fair to say, in all three of these approaches is on conceptual schemes, conceptual schemes, rather than on a deductive system of a foundationalist sort, like Descartes and Spinoza attempted, you'll see. Uh, you'll find that Ayer repudiates that sort of deductive system building <coughs> in metaphysics, and he repudiates uh, the notion of a reality that transcends the appearances with which science and common sense deal, as in the Hegelian tradition, reality and appearance. Uh, so the more modest notion of a conceptual scheme. Now, I referred you to page 33, and notice that at the very bottom of that page, he rejects the idea that we are endowed with a faculty of intellectual intuition, uh, which would enable us to identify some Descartes-type first axioms. He repudiates that. And on page 35, he um, states the criterion of verifiability in the middle of the page. A sentence is factually significant to a given person if and only if he knows how to verify the proposition it purports to express. That is, if he knows what observation